Hi, Gary Clayton here. I'm Kevin Coyle. And today we're going to look at the next year of what's going on with the economy and Congress and the markets and so forth. And so basically we're going to go through what's going on in Washington, what's happening with corporate America as far as earnings are concerned, how it affects the markets, and then literally what's just happened recently with the legislation that was passed and the new tax code changes uh, for the fiscal cliff. And uh, Kevin, what's your thoughts about what just happened with the cliff? Well, I have a question for you. I mean, do you really think, I mean, I know you need to use the term because everyone understands it, but uh, do you really think it was a cliff that we were? No, nah, it's just kind of a term that scares people. It was made up by the media, I think, to put a lot of emphasis on it. But, you know, it's a trillion dollars over 10 years, and if you break it down by 120 months, it's not that big a deal. But fortunately enough, we didn't get to test that out. Well, obviously, something had to be done, you know, so when we get to the market overview aspect of it, as long as we can start seeing some incremental signs of progress, which hopefully in the next five or ten days they agree on. Yeah, we'll see so what we'll happens. See. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a little bit of uh, some scenarios that you see right on your screen here. The first one is the slow growth scenario that we think is about a 60% chance of happening. Now this scenario is basically saying that we've got still slow 1.5, 2.5% GDP, uh, that we've got low interest rates, low inflation, corporate earnings around 6 to 10%, so markets should go up gently, um, and the consumer is going to continue spending at the same slower growth rate. The second scenario is more of a quick recovery, but we need a couple things to happen. First, uh, Congress in Washington really has to get their act together and be proactive and solve this crisis we're in. Uh, we got to have good things happen in Europe, things have to get better there. Then we might see a little more, more of an increase. And then finally, in the down scenario, which is really can happen if Washington just really locks up completely and does nothing again this year, we have a real chance of going into a, probably a mild recession. And that could also come from more problems in the Middle East or with Europe uh, in their crisis. So this, we'd like to go into now looking at the economy and start with housing. Now this chart that you're seeing is looking at the Case-Shiller housing index and you see that big up and down and now in the last year we've had the housing start to move up. So we're starting to see some real growth. The housing market is uh, new, new housing starts back to normalized levels. Uh, beyond that, we have employment. We lost almost 9 million jobs, got back 6 million of them, and we're growing about 180,000 jobs a month, which is great because we're chipping away at getting people back to work, uh, and that will really help long term, but we still need to have that thing move up to the 250 or 300,000 jobs a month to really have some great growth take place. And then we have inflation. It's really kind of been a non-issue. The Fed is watching it very closely. It's been running in this 2 to 3% range for, as you can see in this chart, for the last 10 years. And fortunately, it's not have to been dealt with as we have moved along. Uh, gross domestic product. Uh, it's really only grown about 7.5% over the last three years, about 2 to 2.5% two a year. That's slow for coming out of a recession. But Again, we went through a severe recession, so it's going to take a very long time to come out of that, and we're just seeing that continue along, probably for another year or two, depending on other factors we'll discuss a little later. Consumer finances. This particular chart is very interesting. You can see for the past 30 years, up until 2008, we spent and spent and spent by basically accumulating more debt. And then, magically, in October of 2008, consumers, all of us, decided to start reducing debt. And you just see this go down very rapidly. And so we went from this 14% of disposable income all the way down to 10% of disposable income. And we're back to basically the 70s. This is great for the future. It will really help because the consumer will start spending again once we get through this morass that we find ourselves in. Now the federal budget. This is the big negative out there. As you can see from this chart, you have to go back to World War II to see our federal deficit being greater than our GDP. In fact, it's about 104% right now. So it's just been very rapidly rising. It has to be addressed by Washington or it will cause major issues down the line. And then finally, this last chart you're looking at is the new tax code changes that we talked about a little earlier. You know, Kevin, it's uh, really going to only affect our clients that are 250,000 and 450,000 mm -hmm. and above. And we, got, we have a few in that area, and it's mainly 5% higher in capital gains tax and 3.8% because of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, uh, that's going to increase that. 
But beyond that, it shouldn't affect anybody else. So it actually came out fairly well for clients as better than we thought it would. Anyway. So that cliff didn't prove to be as steep? No, the cliff got kind of leveled quickly, right. actually. Right. So we have some primary risks out there, and the primary risk really comes down to Washington. They got to get out of this gridlock, they got to talk to each other, and they got to come up with something substantive that we really believe in, that all of, everybody in the country believes can actually work. And I think we could have this thing start to move back up. Secondary risks, you know, the North, Northern European countries are getting to the point where they're kind of don't want to keep bailing out the Southern European countries. And the European Union really has got to get their act together. And if they don't, and it gets worse. That could affect us. And again, like I said earlier, could put us into a recession. And then a surprise, you know, there can always be a war between Israel and Iran. We have Korea. We always have Middle East problems going on. Any of those can really be a factor out there. But really what I'd like to do right now is, is pass this off to Kevin and have you talk about what's going on with the markets. Well, you know, there's always going to be those outside risks that we're always going to be confronted with, depending whether it's 2013 or 2020 or, two, or 1990, whatever, and we're always going to have certain volatility in the world. That's not going to that's not going to get fixed overnight. Right. But you know, you talked about the households um, reducing debt. A lot of that was out of necessity. Um, corporations have been doing that as well, and you've seen recovery in, in, in profitability um, since the decline in 2008 um, as as earnings have come back. Companies have been holding back, however, because of the uncertainty. They're, they're holding a large amount of cash. Um, they've been um, slow in hiring back em employees. Um, so their profit margins are higher. Their productivity is higher. That's been a positive for the market. Skeptics would say that, you know, that's not sustainable forever either. Well, just like any economic environment, uh, you need a backdrop of new innovation growth, whether it be energy, some of the things that are happening in this country, whether it be the, the continuing expansion of the, of the consumer class and the emerging economies. Um, you know, there's always been some form of an innovation, which is in your 20% probable um, best case scenario, is, is always going to be out there. Um, you know, we haven't exhausted all the world's resources yet, there still is growth. As long as we continue to make marginal improvements in uh, not only household, but also our government uh, as well as in overseas, I think the market could be poised uh, for positive moves if we start seeing some incremental positive signs there. Um, obviously, any up tick and compounding economic activity, especially with increasing housing, um, companies reducing or, or, or being uh, willing to start allocating some of their cash. There's been a pent up demand and deferment of capital expenditures. Right. You could see a, a compounding there, which makes that 20% probable scenario, you know, something that's always what a long-term investor is looking for. On the negative side, you know, we're always going to, there's always the possibility of recessions and, you know, if earnings decline 20 to 30%, you'll see the markets decline, you know, accordingly. Right. In which case, you know, anything in the long-term nature in your, in your investment allocation should be willing to, to tolerate that kind of a decline. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things we read recently, you and I talked about this a lot, is, you know, are we optimistic or pessimistic? And it seems like people are just less pessimistic, I mean, really on that side of it. And so there really needs to be a change in, in consumer confidence out there for folks really to get back right, into this right. thing. You know, I think it's, the markets go from, you know, the, the old adage is they go from um, you know, pessimism to optimism to euphoria. I certainly don't think we're at euphoric levels uh, from that standpoint. <clears throat> you know, another issue that we, we should really touch on real briefly before we finish is, is the level of interest rates and people mm -hmm. thinking about a bond bubble and things of that nature. You know, obviously most folks are, are keeping their anything in the fixed income arena in the uh, four years or less or something of that nature, you yeah, know, obviously term. if interest rates go up, the value of those bonds will go down, but they'll be able to roll out the yield curve, i.e. buy higher yielding debt um, as rates rise. But there's, once again, that's that uncertainty of the, the pending possibility of interest rates mushrooming up quickly. You know, that's the, the big issue that the Fed really needs to address with the amount of money that they've been putting into the system is when the economic activity um, begins to pick up, they're going to have to ease off that accelerator and, and, and pull some of that money out of the system which, you know, this is unprecedented. So that's another risk that needs to be addressed yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. So in conclusion, basically, uh, we're looking at slow growth economy, maybe slowly moving up stock market, being careful in the long side of the bond market. Uh, and hopefully Washington gets their act together and we see something proactive come out of that, out of that city for once in the past decade. <laughs> I, I echo your sentiments. Thank you. See Thank you next you. time.